This is the House of Hockey podcast, where we talk about the game and the lifestyle. We've got opinions as hockey fans, friends, and from the female perspective. Welcome to our house. Welcome to the House of Hockey podcast. This is episode 185. I'm one of your hosts, Ray Ray Breezy. The other co-host is still on long-term injured reserve. So it's just me today, and I have a super special treat for you. I have Connor Doherty. He is with the Maine Mariners in the ECHL. He is their captain for the last three seasons. His first season with the team, he was given the C and has worn it ever since. And welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. That was quite the intro for me, so I appreciate it. Oh, um, come but, on. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's get down to it. Okay, talk to me about what it's like playing hockey in Portland, Maine. Yeah, I mean, it's been... It's been a, a incredible experience for me. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, so not too far away. Um, and I used to grow up going to the Worcester Ice Cats games, so then became the Worcester Sharks. Um, so I always kind of remember they had a little rivalry with the Portland Pirates. Um, right. And so I just remember watching them coming down. And I, at that age, I didn't really know too much about Portland. Um, but then as I grew up, kind of coming up to Maine for summer vacations or long weekends, kind of stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, fast forward and luckily I'm, I've been able to play, uh, in Portland. Um, and the fan base here has been incredible there. You can tell they know the game. Uh, they know when to cheer, when not to cheer, when the team needs a little boost. Um, so I mean, it's been an incredible experience and I couldn't really have asked for much more. Yeah. I mean, that's always important that the fans know what's going on on the ice and yeah. you're a Bruins affiliate. So there's a lot of bees gear at the games too. Yeah. Yeah. And they even gave us uh, recently the third jerseys that we wear uh, with the black and gold um, to kind of align a little bit more with that affiliate. Um, so I just think sometimes people would come to the games and they would see the Providence Bruins with the black and gold. And then we had the blue and green and white, um, so it was kind of cool on Sundays. We would usually wear those jerseys and the fans would always be uh, super excited for that. Yeah. There's a lot of excitement in ECHL with fan engagement and the theme nights. I think that's a lot of fun and something that really separates your league. And I love that. Like I love a theme night and I love that you guys wear the jerseys and I'm wearing my mean wild blueberry shirt for those not watching. Um, if you don't know, Google it. It's spectacular. It's an angry blueberry. Um, and you have a night where you do that. Uh, do you like those nights? Like, are those fun for you to wear a different Jersey or does it have a different feel? Cause you're not repping your like core identity as a team. Um, no, I mean, I've I've actually had a lot of great experiences with them because usually those nights uh, attract a lot of fans. So you get a lot more fans in the building, um, even though we've had great turnouts. But depending on the night, especially like you said, the Wild Blueberries night, um, that is probably the most popular night that we have throughout the year. So you're usually playing in front of a sold out crowd or close to it. Um, I do think that some of the jerseys that they've started to make up or kind of come up with do get a little bit outrageous at times um some of them that we were wearing or that you kind of look at it and you're like well how am i going to go play a serious hockey game with this on <laughs> um yeah. but I, I do get the idea behind it and like i said it brings out the fans um and then usually they raffle them off then they always go to a good cause uh charity or what it may be so yeah. at the end of the day you do know that they're going to a good cause and it's it's for one night um and i think we usually only have maybe eight throughout the season so nothing too crazy yeah what's the funniest or weirdest one you've had to wear so far oh man i that is i feel like the list could go on and i there was like a dad bod night or something yeah i've been trying to i mean we had they actually turned out pretty well but one night it was racing night so we had like the pit crew so it was like an all-white jersey with the one stripe going down the side all the way through the socks so those actually turned out pretty well um but then sometimes i feel like you have the superhero nights and it's some of them can get a little outrageous i've seen teams that were i think it was patrick versus spongebob one night and they had like pink gloves and it was, it was kind of I don't, the jerseys I don't think turned out as well as they expected them to. Um, so you do see around the league some of the jerseys. It's same thing. You get the idea behind them all, but sometimes you're just like, oh, I don't know if I would, would want to wear that one. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I get what you're saying. It would be a little weird in a in a Patrick jersey. And then you like 
getting heated and being like, let's throw the gloves and you look ridiculous. Like how, <laughs> I don't know how you just have to tune it out. Right. That's why you're professional. Yeah. I guess at the end of the day, you almost forget about it. But, and then I will say on the flip side though, I, I feel like most teams do it, but there's always a military night. Um, yeah. And those jerseys in the years past have always been, I would say, top notch. Um, and that's kind of cool to be able to wear red, white, and blue or uh, represent some of the armed forces. Um, so I would say those are kind of on the flip side where you get to put those on. And it's it's usually a special night for that. Yeah, those are always meaningful. Yeah. Um, something that's not as meaningful, but is gathers a lot of attention on the internet and on social media is the night that the fans get to throw bras on the ice. Yeah. I think it's like sports bras and uh, underwear night. And the... <laughs> okay. What, why do you throw a pair out too? Like, do you give, give like the family a pair to toss? Like at the get, like, what is that? I mean, I, I, the first year they did, I think last year was the first year they did it. When I, people were sending it to me on Instagram left and right, like all my friends and family and stuff. And I, I was like, I honestly have no answer for you. It's just, it's something I don't, I don't know who came up with the idea. Obviously built off of the teddy bear toss. Someone came up with it. Um, and I, I do think they do a big stress on it has to be new and in packaging. They don't want any like used underwear being tossed on the ice because that'd just be a whole different issue. Um, and I, I don't know exactly. I probably should by now, but I think it goes to maybe like a local uh, clothes yeah. drive or something like that. But when you kind of see those ads coming around, I think the first year it blew up on Twitter and everyone was kind of like, why are they doing this and what is the point of it? Um which I don't know, maybe they didn't advertise it the right way, but because when I first yeah. saw it, I was like, this is this is something else. Yeah. Well, that's the headline, <laughs> right? Like that's to get you interested and to get you to click and read, right? But Yeah, yeah. So it, it is funny, though, I guess when you do score the first goal and you just see all these like bras, underwear, everything just being tossed all over the ice. So it's has some humor to it, has a good cause, same thing, too. But, uh, you know, it's always kind of like, what will they think of next? Yes. Yes. Well, I can't help but notice you're missing um, a tooth, maybe more than one. Yeah, it's two, uh, two actually. It's, it's a small area, but... You are a defenseman, and you've got quite a bit of penalty minutes, and you've broken some records with them as well. Um, how did that How did that go down? Was that from a fight or a puck? Is there a good story? Well, it's actually, uh, it is a good story, I would say, but it's almost the complete opposite. I was actually just born without them. Uh, what? Believe it or not. Yeah. So I had, everyone's like, maybe you were just born to play hockey then. So I was born. So I had my baby teeth until I was 18. Um, and then they had to yank them out and they put a, a fake tooth in there, like a screw and everything um, that they ended up having to take out last year. So that's why I'm toothless. But so tomorrow I'm actually going in for surgery for them to put the tooth back in. So you caught me on the right day where we can we can think of a story maybe on in the next uh, few minutes on what I should start studying instead. But so yeah, no uh, no hockey story behind it. Just just born without them. I can't believe that. That's so perfect. Talk to me about your penalty minutes. Um, I gotta. I'm I'm scared to click over because sometimes this platform shuts down on me when I move over. But. You had 113 penalty minutes this season, and you broke – no, you set the franchise record for penalty minutes um, in the 22-23 season. Um, that's pretty impressive. So you like you like the box. Uh, I guess so. That is uh, – yeah, I, I guess I get a little extra rest in there. I don't get as tired, but <laughs> – I think it's just, I don't, I think ever since I started playing, I've kind of always just been more of that hard nosed, uh, stay at home defender. And I think sometimes that style of play leads me into some penalties more than others. Um, try and stick up for some teammates or get the other team off their game. So it's not as flashy of a stat as leading the team in goals or assists and stuff like that. But I think, you know, that's, that's part of the hockey. What, uh, I think everyone needs some, whether you're forward or D-man, I think there's a, a price to pay. And I will say, I try not to do it um, in ways to put the team shorthanded. I think a lot of those minutes are uh, matching penalties and stuff like that. Um, or I try and take a guy to the box with me. Because I think if if a lot of those were putting the team down shorthanded, then it's, it's almost defeats the purpose of it. But I guess, yeah, like I said, I don't know. I feel like nowadays there's becoming a lot more of the uh, high-flying skilled 
the offensive demon and I try and add part of that that to my game but I think at the end of the day I've just kind of always had that hard nose stay at home don't let the other team score and do whatever it takes and unfortunately I think early in my career that led to some fights and stuff like that that I kind of had to learn how to do that coming out of college hockey that's no fighting or anything like that so that was a big adjustment um but I'd say now that I'm getting older a little bit older I'm not necessarily going out looking for those fights and uh I'd rather kind of just play the hard-nosed game and then if something happens it happens but that's uh that's a different story I guess so how did you, how, yeah, how did you learn to fight or who taught you? Did you have anybody help you or did you just have to figure it out on the ice? Yeah, actually my first year uh, when I was playing for the Worcester Railers, um, one of my roommates and teammates at the time was Yannick Turcott, who uh, made a name for himself around the league and many leagues for being quite the tough guy, uh, definitely knows how to fight. Um, and he was he was a forward that no one really wanted to mess with. And I think he just kind of, or maybe I latched onto him in a way, but he basically said, he's like, the way you play, I love it, but I'm sure this is going to come your way at times. So it's kind of like practice together. And um, that way we, we just helped each other out. And so at the end of the practice, sometimes we'd square up, kind of just work on the grappling part of it, not actually punching each other. Um, so I do yeah, have to give it a, a big... That would be weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would be taking a little too far. So I do have a big thanks to him. Uh, I think he helped save me a few times. So Yeah. yeah. This season didn't turn out the way you had hoped, probably, you know, you did make it to the playoffs though, and got an exit in the first round, but, um, the team's been pretty strong here in Maine and you guys bring a lot of people in and you play a tough game of hockey. So what do you have to say to, um, to that and, and to the fans? I mean, yeah, first, uh, same thing. You couldn't really do it without the fans, so it's a big thank you to them. Uh, I mean, if they're not coming to the games, then we wouldn't have a team. So yeah. it's a, it's nice to have that support, and I think that support also helps draw other players in and makes the recruiting for the coaches a little bit easier where you can say, hey, we're going to play in front of 5,000 fans a night. Um, that That is a little more attractive for players than saying, you know what, on any given night we only might have a couple hundred people here and it'll be dead silent. <laughs> Um, but and then I think at the ev- beginning of every season, your goal is to win the Kelly Cup in this league, or if you're in the NHL, the Stanley Cup. And I think every team would say the same. So anytime you fall short of that, unfortunately, you would basically call the season not successful. But um, I think to make the playoffs, you kind of have to hang your hat on that and say, you know what, all right, that's a step in the right direction. And we've done that the last three years. Um, and like you said, unfortunately, it was another first round exit, but we took the number one seed uh, in the entire Eastern Conference to Game 7. And basically, I wouldn't say it a bounce, but they, they earned the goal. It was uh, just in the in the crease. They fought for it and kind of poked it in, and that was they ended up getting an empty netter. But, you know, that could have just as well been us. And yeah, uh, so that game was almost a flip of a coin, and then we'd be on to the second round. So I think same thing to be able to take the number one seed to Game 7 and have our chance to win it. It's... Another thing that you almost look back on and say, all right, these are some stepping stones to build on moving forward. Yeah, they are. Uh, Off season now for you, you've got uh, surgery for your teeth, for your new teeth. (laughs) But do you uh, watch, uh, do you switch over and watch the NHL and are you watching playoffs? And another question though, because I don't know what your NHL team fandom is, or if you can even really say that, but are you a Bruins fan? I would assume being from mass. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up uh, an hour outside of Boston. So it's all sports, New England, Boston. Uh, so yeah, Patriots, Bruins, Celtics, even going out of the New England revolution, keep the soccer team in there. Um, but yeah, so I, I will definitely be tuning into the Bruins tonight. They had a great game one down in Florida the other night, which is good to see. Um, and you have Swayman playing the way he is right now. It's knock on wood for them, but I don't know if the team will beat them if he keeps that up. Yeah. Do you uh, – have you always been a lifelong Bruins fan? Since I actually I mean, have, yeah. I don't know. It was... I mean, like, I know you said you follow all the teams in, in Boston, but were you, like, a diehard fan? Um. Yeah, I mean, I would say I, I – opposed to like all the NHL teams I definitely followed them uh, closely and I would watch their games growing up I didn't really go to too many um, 
but yeah, we would always have the games on the TV growing up. And I mean, but same thing with the Red Sox, Celtics, uh, Patriots. So I think just kind of our house in general and our friend group, I uh, would always basically just root for sports in general. And then obviously you, you want your team to be on. And luckily enough, the age that I've grown up in, there's been a lot of success in this area where they talked to like my parents and they had the Celtics at one point, but other than that, they were kind of like every other team stunk. So <laughs> I think uh, I've been very lucky in that sense of it, watching a lot of championships. So, so it's made it easy to root for them. It has. And it's, it's a great sports town too. You know, it's, it's hard to beat. I'm sure they, you and they all say it's the best sports town, you know, but we're, we're not going to go down that road because that gets <laughs> really messy and I'm from Chicago. So, you know, we're, we'll just leave that. Right. There could be uh, yeah, we don't need to start any arguments or anything like that, raising our voices over it all, but. No, <laughs> no, we do not. <laughs> um, we're friends here. We're basically, we're neighbors to a degree. So, you know, right. not actual, but you know, I, I might see you on the street and I don't really want to face your fists, you know, not that you would, <laughs> but you know, we'll leave it at that. So you had mentioned when you were talking about, you know, the penalty minutes and fighting and all of that and, and saying you're not really looking to, to have to do that if possible. Is that have anything to do with, um, having a family and, and you're a dad, right? I am. Yep. Yeah. We have, uh, one right now she's 16 months and then my wife is due, uh, in another, well, June 24th. So that's like six weeks away. So we'll be, uh, yeah, soon to be a family of four or family of five. If you include our dog, Chester, can't leave him out. Uh, Got to include the dog. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, um, I, I honestly, maybe a little part to do with that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that shies me away from it all. I think it just may be getting older too. It's kind of almost look to some of the younger guys that are trying to find their way into the league to do that. Um, and like I said, it's nothing that I don't, it's not that I like wouldn't do it. It's just maybe there's other parts of the game that I'm trying to focus on now. Um, and I think kind of, especially as you get older, you know, it's not easy to get in a, a fight and cause it is a legit fist fight. So Maybe sometimes it is, you know, let the younger guys do that and find their way into the league. Um, and then if it does happen or I need to stand up for a teammate, then that's a whole nother thing. But yeah. it's, uh, I wouldn't like say, it. I wouldn't say I'm sitting in the locker room being like, all right, let's go drop the gloves right away. Where I no. do know plenty of guys I've played with and played against that, that love it, um, which kudos to them. But great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think there's for me, like I said, there's there's some other parts of the game I like to focus on a little bit more now. Yeah. Yeah. And like recovery time as, as we get the years under our belt becomes a little, you know, <laughs> longer. So, you know, it, yeah. Yeah. The less bumps and bruises you have to deal with, it, it helps that recovery process. Uh, it exactly. still takes its time. So does the family come to home games? What is that like? What's like, do they wear your, you know, Doherty on the back with like a jacket? Are they, is your daughter there? And you know, what's that yeah. like for you? Yeah. Uh, my wife, Abby was great. I think Sumner, who's our daughter, uh, she was at the game, I think when she was maybe eight days old or 10 days old last year. So right away, uh, my wife brought her and, um, I mean, at that point had her in the stroller and it was fun to know that she was there, but obviously she couldn't really watch her. She would try and watch as She got a little bit older. Um, but wasn't really comprehending it. Um, but then, yeah, fast forward to this year and my wife would take her to all the home games that they could. And there'd be a couple nights where Abby would be like, you know what? I, I really want to focus on this game and get a babysitter. Right. Um, just cause she does need to, she takes a little bit more now that she's up and walking around. Um, yeah. but there was a game this year that they came down to the glass, um, for warm ups, and, you know, it was cool to see Sumner had a big smile on her face, gave me a high five through the glass. Um, and coming off between periods, she'd always be excited, kind of waiting there to see me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's an experience that I honestly never thought I'd have growing up. And then even when you're playing at college, you never know if you're going to continue after college. Um, so to be able to play yeah, in front of my family and growing family, it's been quite the experience. And we always say that maybe not uh, just because they're so young right now that they may not necessarily have these memories, but we'll have the pictures and Abby and I will have the memories for it and stuff that we can talk about. Um, so, I mean, the hope is to keep playing a little bit. So hopefully they'll maybe be able to 
remember some of it, but yeah, it's uh, honestly probably something that words really can't explain to have that, those moments. Yeah. How is that for you when you're on the road, Ben? Uh, it's definitely, it's tough. I would say luckily our division isn't um, overly heavy on travel. Uh, yeah. I think we usually have one trip a year that will either go south or out west um, and we'll be gone for a week during that. So that's definitely a little bit harder leaving them behind and uh, a lot more of the heavy lifting goes on to Abby and stuff. But uh, usually we're gone for maybe a night, maybe two, uh, which in that sense is nice, but it's still kind of hard to pack up and go. And yeah. um, But I will say that that's probably when I do get the most sleep. So it's <laughs> <laughs> not that I will. Yeah, Sumner has been a great sleeper, but it is some of those mornings on game day, you get to sleep in a little later. Um, yeah. So that, that part of it, I will say, is a treat for me. I won't lie about it, but no. it is hard to leave them behind. Um, yeah. And it, it's always fun coming home to them, though. I'm sure. My wife played basketball in college and <laughs> growing up, though, so I don't know if it'll be a big battle between if we want her to skate or play basketball, or I'll just let her pick and see what happens. Yeah, she could do both. Have you put her on but, skates yet? Not, not like we've tried to put them on her feet, and I just feel like every pair we've gotten has been still too big for her but she's been out on the ice like in her sneakers and i've skated around with her um and she i mean she's loved that part of it so i think there is a little something something moving in her head thinking about it good well there's definitely some athleticism there in some capacity so (laughs) i guess we'll see yeah i saw that you won uh the echl's community service award in 2019 2020 um, tell me about that and what community and, and giving back means to you. Yeah, that was uh, back when I was playing in Worcester, too. And uh, they, at the time, I had been there for a couple of years. So I had kind of developed a good relationship um, with their community director there. And then I, that's uh, right around the area I grew up. So I grew up in this small town called Holden. Um, but at my mom taught school in Worcester. My dad worked in Worcester. Uh, so just like around that area, I'd, kind of grown up and seen what other athletes in the area had done. So I think that was just a good opportunity for me to really give back. And um, at the time they, they were, or still are heavily involved in the community. So they made it easy on me, but it was nice to know that an area that I grew up in and these athletes that had kind of an impact on me growing up, I kind of wanted to be that uh, person for them. And it's one of those, you know, if you change, one kid's day or put a smile on a kid's face or what a family kind of, we did some food drives and stuff like that. Um, I think that's part of what being in a position, I guess, whether you're an athlete or any other, um, trying to think of basically like at any time, if you can give back in the community, I think it's, it's a good way to do it. Um, and I think just the position I was in, they made it super easy for me. Um, and I, I still try and do as much as I can kind of in these areas. It's just uh, obviously now it's a little bit harder with uh, the kids. And when I'm off of practice, I'm a dad first right now, which is great. Um, and I wouldn't change that for anything. But it's uh, it, it's good to be able to, I think, just give back to the, the fans that they're the ones that are paying their money to come see you play and uh, helping support you. So it's in a way to kind of go back and support them. Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, congratulations. I mean, you still had to do it and and participate and, you know, they might have set it up and and had a program, but um, I think that speaks volumes to your character and just a lot of professional hockey players. And of course I'm biased because it's my favorite sport, (laughs) but, um, you know, I just think it's, it's nice to hear those things too. And um, having that element of, of giving back could we, I'm going to switch gears and make a left turn again. Yeah. Do you have any funny pranks, stories, bus stories, things going awry in your time in the ECHL? Um, anything you can are comfortable sharing? We, we love a, a good I, story. Uh, um, man, I'm trying to think of, I mean, there have definitely been a lot a lot of stories and I feel like some of it's honestly just some of the banter that you have, um, especially on some of the longer road trips on the bus with the team. Um, I will say this is, I won't maybe use exact names for it, but a uh, teammate and I kind of, we basically typed up a letter that made it seem that one of the players on our team like owed money back to the Canadian government around like tax time. 
Um, and at the time he wasn't speaking like great English or anything. So we like, he like kind of came freaking out to us like, what does this mean? What does this mean? Like, can you guys help me out? It says like, I'm going to be like deported almost kind of something like that. And it was one of those that we, we let uh, go on for a couple days and then eventually just told him, Hey, don't worry about it. That was us. Just, but just made him sweat it out for a little. Um, so that was one that comes to mind. And then it was a similar year. It was just one of the guys on our team was, was a big prankster. Um, so we actually put, uh, one of our teammates numbers on Craigslist and had, I think it, we put up like a new England Patriots golf cart and I was like, please contact me if you have like interest in buying this or just come pick it up. So for, I think it was for the next, who knows, maybe 48 hours, same thing. We try not to let these go on too long, but his phone was just getting all these random texts like, Hey, is a new England Patriots golf cart still available? Like phone calls, all sorts of stuff. And they would come into the rank every day. Like my phone, like, who is this? What's going on? Uh, so, and then you kind of just try and laugh in the background without letting them see. Um, of course. So yeah, that, I'd say those are, those are kind of the two I would consider them PG or G rated that yeah, are yeah. kind of just fun that you let stare around for a couple of days and then uh, let them know what's going on. But God, it's, those uh, are I feel like every year there's always, at least one prankster on the team and they kind of just keep you on your toes. It, it adds to the camaraderie, doesn't it? it no, exactly. And that's the, the season is so long and it's so tense, especially at game time that I think some of these stuff, it's, you just have a little fun, gives everyone some laughs, gets your mind off of hockey. And uh, yeah, it gives you a little, like I said, it's a lot about the banter around the locker room and on the bus mm-hmm. that really makes a good team. Did you see what flower did to do Haim? I, he uh, like took his tires off the car and everything, right? Is that he planted a garden on the hood? He put like dirt and flowers and like <laughs> took all the tires off and chained them up and locked them up. Like I say that that to me, I mean, not I guess at that point, like I don't know what he did to Flower to begin the whole prank war, but I was like that that seems a little bit over the top. Uh, you I know mean, what? I'm sure they had the relationship that uh, allowed them to do it. it. They they laughed about it later on. They did, and apparently, uh, the rumor is that Duhame was like, "Okay, I'm out. Like, I'm tapped out. Like, I'm I'm not gonna. I'm done yeah. now. Like, we're done now, <laughs> right? We're not doing this again. You know." So oh, that's funny. The the prank to end it all. It was it was it was pretty incredible. I don't think I've seen or we haven't seen it publicly at least. So yeah. Um, our final three questions. They're a little. They're meant to be light and fun. Um, the first one is: Do you have a Sidney Crosby story? Um, I would say other than I, I feel like when he was coming up, my my sister was like obsessed with him. Uh, <laughs> just being like, oh my god, like he's so cute. Like go Sidney Crosby and. I actually just never really, I was always, I feel like an Ovechkin fan over Crosby for whatever reason. Ooh. I don't know why. Um, not saying like one way or the other, and maybe that was part of it just to root against, you know, like sibling rivalry, be like, oh no, Ovechkin's going to be better. Um, but no, I would say no, like real crazy Sidney Crosby story. That's okay. Um, I think it's great that your sister loved it. <laughs> oh yeah, still does, still does to this day. And that's why I'm always... I mean, he's a great player, but I, I feel like that's why I was always, oh, Ovechkin over Crosby. But um, yeah, they're two, yeah, two, two world class players. Uh, the the next two are, who is your ultimate hockey hunk? Ultimate hockey hunk. Sorry, I've got fuzz in my eye. Oh, that's a tough question. Um, we get a lot of hanks and stuff, but yeah. it can also just be like less about looks and more about like your favorite. Well, I would say, yeah, I mean, I feel like they always gave Henrik Lundqvist the uh, the top of the line. He always had great suits on and stuff like that. And then I think just in general, growing up, I would wear uh, Bergeron. I was would wear 37. He was always kind of my favorite player in the Boston organization following up. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you can argue with Henrik Lundqvist. And then I'll give... Patrice Bergeron as the the runner up. Yeah, Bergy Bergy's got some style. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, who's your favorite hockey lady? It can be uh, on the ice, broadcast off the ice, at home. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like <laughs> I have to 
not I don't know if this is the easy way out, but give it to my wife because she does all the hard work when I'm gone, and she brings Sumner to all the games, um, never misses a home game, stuff like that. And I think a lot of that goes unnoticed because if it wasn't for her support and their support, then uh, I probably wouldn't still be playing to this day. So it's yeah to be able to allow me to travel and go to the rink and play all these kind of later nights and stuff like that. Uh, I got to give her the credit plus mother's day is right around the corner. So yeah. that's another, uh, another added bonus to her. So I'll that's give her the cake on that one. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you, Connor. Thank you for your time. Thanks for chatting with me and, and sharing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good talking with you. Thanks for coming over to our House of Hockey podcast and hanging out with us. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And in the meantime, you can follow us on social media. Just look for House of Hockey podcast. We'll be back next week. 